many business leaders were drowning. So they were working 24-7, way many hours than they wanted to be. They were having difficulties knowing how to manage and how to lead their team. Their passion and their, their drive really came from their craft, but now they had all this business stuff to deal with at the same time. And so I really found a space where I could come in and really help that business leader leverage three things. So their time, their talent, and their tactics. The three T's, I like to call it, so that they could grow their business to the next level, whatever that looked like for them. Are you still doing all the things? Or are you ready to step into the leadership mindset? Today, we'll be talking about that crucial shift from solo contributor to leader manager, or from founder and solopreneur to visionary business leader. And we'll be discovering how to take your team or business to the next level. To do that, I'm joined by this week's guest, Donna Dubé, a certified director of operations, business growth strategist, and host of the CEO Amplify podcast. Donna works with established online service-based business owners who are ready to make a bigger impact. She's passionate about helping business owners work smarter, not harder, escape the hustle and grind culture, and go from stressed out boss to confident leader. We'll be hearing about Donna's career so far, digging into that mindset shift that I mentioned before, as well as other important leadership topics like navigating those difficult conversations, assessing the strengths of your team, building development opportunities into your business or team, and avoiding micromanagement. So lots of big topics for this 101st episode of Leading with Integrity. New and first-time leaders can face big challenges in the first few years of being a leader, including the isolation and loneliness at the top, low confidence, gaps in knowledge, working through your changing relationship with colleagues, and imposter experience as well, which is not to be sniffed at. If any of those sound familiar, then head over to www.leadernotaboss.com today and sign up to join the Integrity Leaders online community. It's there specifically to help you overcome these kinds of challenges and to improve your leadership skills at work. Reach out to me anytime if you want to learn more. All of my details are in the episode notes below. And now let's welcome Donna onto the Digital Airwaves. Welcome to the Leading with Integrity podcast. Leadership talk for the modern manager. With your host, David Hatch. Donna, welcome to Leading with Integrity. It's great to have you on the show. Really looking forward to our conversation today. Yes, thank you, David. I'm looking forward to it as well. Great to hear that. And let's get kicked off then by really giving you the virtual mic to introduce yourself to the listeners tell us a bit about your your background your business what you do today why you do it Mm, yes okay i promise to give the short version (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) Um, so i actually started my career in healthcare so very different from the online space i was uh, an icu nurse and then moved into manager of a cardiac unit for quite a while and then, of course, had kids and family and decided to to make a shift. So I moved into the online space as a project manager. And some people may wonder, well, that's very different from ICU nursing. How do you make that switch? Um, and it's true, there are differences, but I found there's a lot of similarities as well. So I've always been one to want to serve and to help people. That's my my heart, my natural gift. Um, and I also feel that the, the patients and their families, while I don't like to refer to them as projects, it was a bit of managing <laughs> their life and death health at that time, right? Um, so yeah, so in the online space, I kind of came into, you know, six, seven figure businesses, mostly service-based businesses to help them with a specific project. 
whether that was a launch of a new um, offer or program, or I want to write a book or whatever that project was and really set up those timelines, map those milestones, budget, team, all that kind of thing. And while I really enjoyed that work, David, I found that I learned so much about business leaders and the fact that well on the front end, things were looking shiny and good. On the back end, many business leaders were drowning. So they were working 24-7, way many hours than they wanted to be. They were having difficulties knowing how to manage and how to lead their team. Their passion and their, their drive really came from their craft, but now they had all this business stuff to deal with at the same time. And so I really found a space where I could come in and really help that business leader leverage three things. So their time, their talent, and their tactics. The three T's, I like to call it, so that they could grow their business to the next level, whatever that looked like for them, without sacrificing their health, their family, their life, really. Um, and so that's where I sit now in the operations field on the back end of, of their businesses, making sure that, you know, we have rinse and repeatable systems and processes in place. How do we lead and manage our team? How do we fire? How do we hire? Um, how do we look at data and metrics and really know what it means? And so um, that's where I like to sit and uh, and hang with my clients. I think there's probably quite a lot of transferable skills, actually, from healthcare. Um, mm. I imagine you have to be pretty well organized with things like medication and timings and so on. So that, yes. that does fit well, I think, with project management. Um, yes, yes. 100%. I'm a project manager as well in my spare time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, that's an interesting one. And uh, again, it's it's a story I hear from quite a lot of the tech businesses I've worked with over the years as well, about particularly when there's a, a, a strong sort of founder-led idea in the business. Usually that's that person has a technical background. It's their concept their idea their passion and then they've started a business because that's the best way they can see to realize that Mm -hmm. but then very quickly the business grows a little bit and it's well i don't want to be doing that management bit i don't want to deal with the finances i hate spreadsheets i just want to work on my my cool technology that i thought of leave me alone i want to do that (laughs) right right exactly Um, yeah Yes. And I think, you know, there's this mindset shift that needs to happen as the leader because many start out as a solopreneur, right? Mm -hmm. So you're doing all the things, but then as your business grows, you have to be looking at your business as you are the CEO. Yes, it's not the same as Microsoft and Apple, right? But you still are responsible for the vision and the strategy. And if you don't take time in your week and set time aside to be able to you know, really hone in on that and then be able to show that and deliver that to your team, it's really difficult to get where you want to go. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the biggest challenges in leadership really, isn't it? Is being able to shift into that mindset at the right moment. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. First question then. Yeah. One of the biggest challenges, aside from the one I just mentioned, difficult conversations. A lot of leaders Mm. really struggle with those. They hate doing it. They avoid doing it as long as possible. But ultimately, they're inevitable. Um, And the longer you put it off, the the worse it's going to be usually as well. So what what approaches could you suggest that leaders might be able to take to navigate those conversations, but without damaging the team dynamic? Yes, yes, for sure. So I have sort of three quick steps um, to do to navigate those difficult conversations. And as you said, David, they are inevitable, right? So get just get it under your belt that this is going to happen at some point. You may not be in this situation at this time, but it's going to happen. And it's a mountain that you don't need to die on and you can certainly climb over. Um, so don't ignore it. Don't push it under the rug because it will just fester and get bigger. So try and discuss it as early as possible, even if that feels uncomfortable. And then when you're giving feedback, you want to make sure that that feedback is receivable. So what I mean by that is that you want to get almost a micro yes from the person that you're speaking to before you start to give the feedback. So you're kind of giving them a warning sign that, you know, I want to have a little conversation about this thing. Um, so they're prepared and they're ready for it. And this helps bring down the defensiveness that um, people get sometimes when we bring something critical or negative to them. 
And then you really want to make sure you're focusing on the behavior and not the person. It can be so easy if we let that subjective and emotional side come in. But if we really focus on the objective and the data, that makes a big difference in the conversation. And then the second piece is to make feedback actionable. So we want to be really clear about what the feedback is, make it short, make it succinct, and share the impact that that is having on the business, on the team, on someone else, so that it's really clear to the person you're speaking to why this matters. And then the third piece is to make feedback balanced. So what I mean by balanced is that you ask, you tell, and then you ask. So as an example, let's say you have a coworker who, um, you know, took longer to reply to an email than you would have expected. So you want to ask first. You want to get that micro yes. So you say, do you have 10 minutes to talk about the last email that you sent to Sally? So now we're, we're queuing the person up to know this is what the conversation is about. And then you tell. I noticed you responded to her email 10 days after she sent it. I mentioned that because, you know, she can't move forward on whatever project it is without your reply. So we're really delaying her team if we don't respond sooner. So we've told her quickly what the problem is, and we have quickly showed her what the impact is. And then we ask, what are your thoughts? So we give that person a chance to respond to what we've just told them. And by doing it this way, where we set it up, ask, tell, ask, and make it short and sweet, we've really set the conversation up for success rather than, you know, why are you taking so long to answer that email? Which we sometimes feel like saying as humans, right? <laughs> but we want to be able to give that that chance to do that process. So that really does make a difference. And, you know, at the end of the day, we want mutual purpose, right? We want that person to see why we're bringing this up, why it makes a difference, and for us to work together to find a solution. Yeah, I particularly like that, that approach to feedback. And I think... It it's a mistake I've made quite a few times. I've only kind of relatively recently realized that even just a simple question of why, it can be seen as quite accusatory <laughs> and and people react to it badly. Like, well, hang on, you know, it's no need to have a go at me sort of response. Yes, yes. And, that, and if, if people get into that kind of defensive mode, you know, you've already lost. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. yeah, and I think the other big aspect that's quite often overlooked in communication, particularly in the feedback scenario, is you've got to listen much, mm -hmm. much more than you speak with any kind of communication, in my opinion, but especially when you're in the leadership role. Yes. And incorporating that into the feedback by giving those two questions at either end and allowing them the opportunity to put their perspective forth, I think that's really important, and I think it's – Probably the difference between successful and failed feedback, I would mm. get as far as to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think the thing is, when we say, you know, do it frequently, do it often, don't let it sit. But if you need a few minutes to get yourself together, don't do it in the heat of the moment. Right. So when you realize Joan hasn't done X, Y, Z, oh, I've told her how to do this three times. How come she doesn't know? That's not the, <laughs> the time, right? We have to take a step back, take a big breath. Okay, how am I going to set this up for success, right? And sort of prepare yourself beforehand before you have that conversation, not in the heat of the moment when you're right, things can go awry very quickly. Yeah, and that can be a tricky balancing act in itself as well because – I think sometimes if feedback isn't timely, then it, the message gets lost, doesn't it? I think yes. it, it depends on the context, doesn't it? And, and whatever the issue is you're trying to address. But I think if you wait, say, a week or a month, yep. by the time you do it, they've probably forgotten yes. what they did and why they did it. And you've probably forgotten as well, actually. Exactly. Why it <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yes, so, yeah, yes. I think that's that's an interesting needle, isn't it? It's trying the thread between doing it quickly enough that it's still relevant, but not so quickly that you're still really het up about it and you, you botch the conversation because you're angry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, that's right, right? And I find sometimes just 
just, you know, taking a, a Google Doc or whatever it is and trying to write out the objective data that I have for a situation helps me to really focus on that objective and not the subjective side, right? And that kind of helps me to bring down <laughs> my level of emotion and anger as well. Um, and then I have those talking points. So when I get in the meeting, you know, I'm starting to feel uncomfortable, I can bring that up and, and use that, you know, as my as my basis so that I try and keep it as objective as possible. But yes, it's an art, right? It's um, <laughs> it's not a one and done deal. You know, it's something we have to continuously work on. But I think the other piece of this too, David, is having that culture in your business where team members feel comfortable to come and speak. It's a safe place. You know, yes, there's a bit of a hierarchy in the sense that you're the leader, you're the boss. That that's there, right? But trying to have that open space and that open environment where team members can come and give their suggestions or their problems, right? And you're you know you're open to hearing that. It's not a top down um, sort of hierarchy where you know whatever you say goes. Where team members can come and share. That really makes a difference because then they when they get it into a situation where there is a difficult conversation. They, you've already got a comfortness that's there, right? They already feel safe and they feel that they can open up and say something. Um, so kind of, you know, trying to instill that from the get-go before you get to a situation where there's a difficult conversation makes a world of difference. I think so too. I think that the psychological safety aspect is really important. And I, again, it's something a lot of managers really struggle to build. And I think Partly that's because it's people miss the fact that it's not something you just do overnight. It's mm. it's the culmination of pretty much everything you've done since you've been in that leadership role. It's the the small, subtle, daily things, the you know, saying phrases like we don't have a blame culture here is one thing, but then if you don't kind of honor that with actions, ah. if if you perhaps imply through something you say or do later that somebody is definitely to blame for something or, or not. Yes. Um, it, you've got to be really kind of mindful of it, I suppose is the word, isn't it? As, as yes. you go, you can't just get to the brick wall of that problem and then suddenly say, we're a psychologically safe environment. <laughs> right. Um, it doesn't work like that, does it? You know, it's, no, no. And I think that's, that is again, why, why so many people struggle with it because it is a, it's a constant habit. It's not something you can only, you only do when, when it's convenient or when you just thought of it or when the problem's already happened. Yes, exactly. Exactly. It's like you, you know, you set up your values as a business. Here is our core values, but then you're right. You have to live that out, right? In a way, it really reminds me of parenting, to be honest with you, because no matter what you do, your kids pick up on your bad habits, right? And pick up on the areas where you're not being true to what you're saying. It's so easy for them to find those areas. And I think the same happens in a team environment, right? So if I'm, you know, rattling off about how we're always disciplined, and then I'm not acting that way, it's so easy for my team, you know, to find those areas. So it's true. It's something you have to keep top of mind on a continuous basis and be willing to say, I messed up, right? I missed the bag here. I dropped the ball. I didn't do, you know, and be comfortable and be humble and be willing to admit that, yeah, I'm human too. And even though this is my business, I'm not perfect, right? And I missed something here. How can we move forward? How can we prevent this from happening in the future? So I think when your team members see that you too you know, have faults and mistakes, it, it makes it much more human to human. Definitely, definitely. I think, you know, the, the, there's the leading by example piece there. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not a parent myself, but certainly I can um, empathise um, yes. having a few children in the extended family. But yes, anyone who's ever accidentally dropped a swear word in front of a toddler knows exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, the bad behaviors are the ones that are so often picked up first, aren't they? <laughs> yes. Definitely. Yeah. And I think the other part of that is is the authenticity, isn't it? It's, it's practicing what you preach. It's living those values, but actually those values are a reflection of you. 
and mm-hmm. and it always reminds me of the thing about the, the truism about um always tell the truth because it's easier to remember yes and that i think sums up authenticity as well you don't have to put on the air and graces and put a lot of effort into living those values if the values already match the way you live yes a hundred percent and i remember working with a client once and um, he did a lot of traveling as as business leader and so many times when we come on a zoom meeting he'd be in the middle of somewhere right not necessarily an appropriate background maybe extra noise you know not as professional as he wanted his team members to be when they showed up on a zoom meeting and so i remember you know having a meeting with him and he was lamenting to me well so and so you know they're showing up they look like they're in somebody's backyard garage and you know they need to be professional and okay but we need to point the finger to you as well right as leader what example are you showing right well that shouldn't but it does that is very close if not the top of my pet peeves about leadership is the uh, one rule for for me and another for mm-hmm. everyone else. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, again, it goes back to what we we're saying about leading by example, doesn't it? Like you can't expect anyone that you're leading to exhibit a certain behaviour or do something a certain way if they see you visibly and blatantly doing the opposite. It's, yes, I, and I, I, yeah. It's one of those things where I, I kind of get why people struggle with it, but I also don't get why people struggle with it because it's, it's quite a simple concept, isn't it? <laughs> like, right. And when you're on the receiving end of it, it makes 100% sense, mm, right? Mm. I want you to act the way, you know, how you want me to act should also be what you do. That makes sense from my end. But somehow when we twist it and we're the leader, we want to be able to, you know, manipulate that and have different rules and, yeah, it just, it doesn't, I mean, you can do that, but the effects of it, you're not going to like. Yeah, I've never seen it work or no. have, a, have a good outcome, especially not in the long run. But yes. <laughs> yes, um, for sure. So let's talk about uh, the management side of a team then. Mm-hmm. What can leaders do to assess the strengths and weaknesses of the people in their team and ensure that everyone is being used to best advantage and they're in the optimal role? Yes, good question. So there's a couple things here. I think we all fall into this trap where we bring a team member on, we may start in a certain position, and then as the business grows, we delegate more and more things to them. Their role changes, but we don't actually go back to that job description. We don't like, don't actually go back to what are their strengths and weaknesses. They're doing all these things, but have we actually looked at, are they the best person for that role? So I continuously encourage my clients to go back to the job description and involve that person in that process, right? Okay. You've been, you know, with me now for another year. We've had some changes in the business. Let's go back to the document. Why don't you take a stab at it, make some adjustments to what you're actually doing compared to what it says, right? And have that a, a process between the two of you to review and adjust the job description. So that's one piece because that really helps us then see what are the strengths that this job description needs and then does this person match that, right? Then the other tool that I really like to use um, comes from the Entrepreneurial Operating System, EOS. And they have a, do I have the right people in the right seats tool? And basically that's what you're analyzing, right? You as a business leader are looking at each of the people in your team. What is their role right now? And are they using their strengths the best of my ability? And if you're in a position where you're like, well, I don't know Susie's strengths. Good. Let's have that conversation, right? Let's have that one-on-one. Let's figure it out because I think it's easy to get stuck in the day-to-day and forget to, to schedule these things, right? So I like to encourage people to have a one-on-one at least quarterly so that that team member has that chance to, you know, have that space with you, bring up issues, problems, and it doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be a complicated corporate performance review, right? Four simple buckets, what's working, what's not working, what's confusing, what's needs improving, right? doesn't have to be complicated, but just to have that touch point to know, 
And we learn so much when we do do that, because then Susie will bring up, well, you know, I really enjoy doing this. I don't have a chance to do that on this team. Well, maybe there is an opportunity. And if it isn't now, maybe it's down the road. But if we don't create that space, we don't know um, what people's strengths are. So I encourage business leaders to do that at the same time that they're doing their planning. So many of us will do, you know, some sort of strategic planning either at the end of the year or the beginning of the next year. And I encourage people to go through the team. You know, where are my goals? Where do I want to go? Do I have the right people in the right seats to get there? And if I don't know, take the time to to have those conversations and figure it out. I think part of the role, certainly the responsibility of leadership, is knowing your people. And so having those conversations, I agree, they're, they're so important. I mean, quarterly feels to me like it's not enough. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, absolute bare minimum, though, definitely. I think the frequency even, though, could also be flexible to the individual because some people they may not want to hear from you that often they they may be happy with just like once every two months or three months or once a year um whereas other people might feel more supported if they're talking to you every week it's yeah i I think there's that flexibility and adaptability piece as well yes but another big and another quite often overlooked role of a leader is building up and helping with the development of their people. Mm-hmm. And that's basically impossible to do if you're not having the conversations as you've described. <laughs> exactly. That's true. So true, right? And building that development of the people you have helps you in so many ways, right? One, it helps get other things off your plate because you can now delegate them to, to the team you have. But it also helps you with this turnover, And in the online space, sometimes the turnover is real, right? And, you know, business leaders like, I can't hire, I'm just bad at it. But but then that might be the case. It's, you know, maybe you're bringing on the right person, but what are you doing once they get there, right? Do you have onboarding? Do you have these open communication environment? Do you have, you know, weekly team meetings? Do you have quarterly check-ins? Are you then looking at their development and where they can grow, Right. Um, it goes a long way if you know that someone on your team wants to learn something, you can, you know, subsidize or partially subsidize a course for them to do. That makes a big difference, right? And they realize that, oh, David actually does care about my growth and development, right? Rather than I'm just a number over here on the side that does the task. Yeah, I think the training piece has always been a pretty powerful retention tool. Mm-hmm. Um but I also think the nature of the world of work has shifted pretty drastically in the last decade, mm-hmm. certainly in the last couple of years. And I think that, you know, to a certain extent, any business leader has to be, has to get comfortable with the fact that turnover is, is, is higher than it was probably when they were first entering the workplace. Yeah. It's, it's pretty normal now that people change jobs every couple of years. Sometimes that's because there's problems in, the current workplace but sometimes it's just because they like to change frequently they're looking mm-hmm. to build more skills and experience different organizations or different industries yeah. and there's not necessarily anything wrong with that i think the important thing in that context though for leaders is to make sure you've got the right processes and the right approach in place mm-hmm. that while they are with you you're still giving them the progression opportunities and the development that the onboarding was done well and then the offboarding is handled mm. well because if they're changing job every two years another two years down the line they might want to come back true yes but they won't do that if you're like well i don't need you anyway i hate you you're leaving don't ever talk to me again you know <laughs> all these horrible things that employers say when they know you're leaving yes yes exactly yeah we want to keep it as professional as possible right indeed but i think also like give them the opportunity to give you feedback as they're leaving like what was good about your experience working here what was bad what could we improve all that kind of thing and mm-hmm. i think that's the sort of stuff that will stick in people's memory yes yes in a good way and then as leader take that and try and not be emotional and have yourself in the middle of it, right? Try and step back and say, okay, if I was looking at a business from the outside and this was the feedback we got, what could we do? How could we adjust and tweak to make it better, 
right? Because when we put ourselves in the middle of it, that's when the friction and the emotions get high, right? Well, she didn't know what she was talking about. Mm -mm. And then we lose that opportunity to use that feedback for the betterment. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's very easy, isn't it, to take it personally when someone leaves. Mm -hmm. And that's probably why people go so wrong with it. Because you're, you're upset, you know, you get a bit emotional. Oh, I thought we had a great working relationship. I'm kind of, I'm sad you're leaving. And so the natural human reaction to that, unfortunately, quite often is shift the blame. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's right. Um, it's interesting. I mean, I, a couple of times in my career where I've, I felt that defensiveness. Mm -hmm. One of them, I, I think I handled it reasonably well is the guy basically just came to me and said, look, I, I don't really want to leave. I enjoy the work, but. There's this other company where I'd also enjoy the work and they've offered to double my salary, at which point I'm like, congratulations. I, right. I can't say anything else to that. <laughs> <laughs> Best of luck, you know, keep in touch. But, I mean, there's not much else you can say about that. Point. Right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there, there were past ones where I maybe didn't handle it so well. Yeah. That's a big part of this, isn't it? Is that this is a journey, right? None of us are expected to wake up and be the best leaders tomorrow, right? But having an open mind and believing that, you know what, I can be 1% better next week. I can be 1% better and that this is a journey and that each opportunity that comes to me, I can use to learn from and to grow. Absolutely. So the next question on our on our list of things about challenges leaders face yeah, is, that is also high again on my list of pet peeves about leadership is the dreaded micromanagement. Mm. So many people struggle with this, um, from like the first time manager all the way up to decades experienced CEOs still doing it. Yeah. And I think a big part of the problem is people just find it really difficult to take that step back, particularly when they're new to leadership because they're used to being hands on in inverted commas. Yes. What are your tips then to help them focus more on that big picture and enabling their team rather than standing over their shoulder or getting in the way? Yes, yes. So I think a couple of things here. One of the big ones is believing in the process that you just went through to hire this person. Believing that you have the right person and you brought them in for their expertise. In order for them to flourish and grow, you have to give them some autonomy and some space. So it's a little bit of trusting at the beginning before you really know if you can trust right? It's almost like you have to stand on the edge of the cliff, not jumping, but close to jumping at the beginning, right? Because you don't know exactly how this person is going to, you know, evolve, but you want to be able to give the best that you can to them. So you want to trust them as much as you can at the beginning. And then the second piece to that is really having processes and systems set up for their success, right? So I think a lot of times what happens is we get so busy, we get over capacity, oh, I'm going to bring in help. And we bring in help, but we haven't set up that person. They don't know where to find the resources that they need. They don't know how this task is supposed to be done, what the expectations of this task is, what success looks like when I'm done the task, and what the deadline for this task is. And so if we don't give them those pieces, of course, they're going to come to us and say, well, David, is it like this? Do you want it? Do you need it next week, Tuesday? Do you want red over here in the corner? And then as leaders, we start going crazy and we say, it's not worth it. It's faster for me to do it myself, right? Again, point the fingers back to us because we didn't set that person up for success. So this doesn't mean that you have to have, you know, a full out documented binder in the corner in the corner with all the processes mapped out, right? We can do it easily, whether that's, you know, sitting down with a person and showing them some things, having a business hub where there's some resources that they can then tap into to find things for themselves. You know, what are the values? What's the mission? What are the offers and the programs and the services that this business even provides, right? Who are the team members? What are their roles? How do I contact them? You know, basic things like this, having that, sort of there available for them really makes a difference. If it's, you know, a particular task that you want done a certain way, take a video of it the next time you do it to show them certain pieces of how 
you want it done, right? Give them a sample of our template of what it's going to look like when they're done. So this is a simple example, but if you want someone to design some images for you in Canva and you say, you know, make me some images using my brand colors. That's pretty wide open in terms of the style, the tone, what you'd like in the image. And so the more detail we can give to that person, that helps them, again, reach that success, right? If we said that and then we showed them three images that we like already, now they've got a visual of, you know, okay, so something along this line, she likes bright colors or, you know, she wants it with males and females in the image or whatever those details are that you want, just taking the time to give that to your team members makes a world of difference. And then the other piece is knowing that when you first bring that person on, it's going to take a little bit more of your time. That's going to be short term and then there's going to be a gain, right? So you're going to have to give some of your time at the beginning to help them with the pieces and be available when they have questions. But as time moves on, they now have more autonomy. They can more fly on their own. And now you have more hours to do your CEO, your business leader level tasks. So there's a short term sort of, this isn't working. This is going to take more time than needed. But then you see the gain afterwards. Yeah, much as I dislike micromanagement as a tool and as a concept, um, or even just a practice of leadership, there, I do accept there are some limited circumstances where it's, it's necessary. So mm. one of those would be, yeah, as you say, it's when they've literally just joined the business, especially if they're very early in their career and their work experience maybe isn't there. It's just, it's kind of inevitable. You, you will have to do that for a certain period. Where I really object to it though is when it's just the default setting, mm. all management, all your leadership, everyone you deal with. I think. When it's necessary at the beginning, it should only be so for a short period of time, at least if you're any good at training people. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and you have to plan for it to tail off because otherwise, I mean, apart from anything else, you just spend the rest of your life doing that mm -hmm. and nothing. You will ever have time for anything else in your business, probably in your personal life either, because you're going to end up working all the time. Mm -hmm. um, it's just it's not sustainable for anyone, is it? No. And when the, and when the added negative effect is that you're probably just going to turn off all your people and they're going to leave. Exactly. So you, again, you're you're stuck in a, re a repeat cycle because you you hire them, you micromanage them, they leave. You hire another one, they micromanage, and you just you'll never get out of the cycle. So yeah, yeah, it's a fun one. And uh, I think the other piece of this too, David, is a little bit of letting go in the sense mm -hmm. that. Putting into perspective what an emergency, what a mistake really is, right? Because as someone is learning, yes, things aren't going to be done maybe exactly the way you want them done, but does it matter? Mm. Right? If the link is correct, does it really matter if it went, you know, this way or that way? I think we have to put those things in perspective and say, well, the information is still there. Yes, it might not have been exactly the way I wanted, but it works, right? Yes. And, yeah. And then there's that chance for feedback to say, okay, great. You did a great job on this. Next time I would like to see X, Y, Z. Yeah. Now, again, with the caveat of what I said earlier about different career stages and seniority of roles and all of that, I think for me, like the, the how something gets done. I really don't think a leader or manager should actually really care about that unless mm. there's, unless there is a very specific like regulatory or legal reason mm -hmm. why, such as mm -hmm. for example, perhaps in healthcare. Yeah. Um, outside of that, it, you shouldn't really care. It shouldn't matter. Like if somebody does something that's completely the opposite to the way you would have done it if you were them, but the outcome is the same. The result is the same. The client's happy. The bill still gets paid, whatever. Yeah. Good, great. Doesn't matter how they did it. Yeah. Except insofar as can we replicate that? Is it a more efficient way? Can we get them to teach everyone else in the team? Mm -hmm. That's the only time I think you really should care about how it's done. Yeah. And I think, you know, you mentioned trust as well right at the beginning of that answer. And I think that's something again where I've always seen it actually, and maybe this is controversial to people. I don't know, but I think the leader has to be the first one to trust. Mm -hmm. 
trust is reciprocal. You've got to put yourself out there a bit. You've got to take that risk. Again, that's part of being a leader. And you've got to just trust someone to go and do the job. Because if you don't, then you shouldn't have hired them, to be honest. Mm-hmm. You might as well just do it yourself and save the salary, right? It's- <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Yeah, and again, it's one of those, another one where I, I, I sort of understand why people struggle with it, but I also don't understand why people struggle with it. It's why else would you hire someone? <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. And I think one thing that helps is, you know, to set up 30, 60, 90 day success goals is what I like to call them, right? And again, doesn't have to be real detailed, doesn't have to be complicated, but having those expectations there right from the beginning so both you and the new team member know, okay, in 30 days, this is what I should be aiming for in 60 days and in 90 days. And then you as business leader have to evaluate at that 30 days, okay, I've been reviewing their work on this side of things. It's time for me to let go of that, let them do it on their own, right? Or this piece still needs a little bit of, of training. So I'm holding on to that still, you know, helping them with it and supporting them with it. But building in the letting go, if you want to put it that way, into that 30, 60, 90 is a way to, you know, measure, okay, am I stepping back and not micromanaging and continuing in that cycle as we move forward? I quite like that idea as well. I think, I mean, goal setting just generally, um, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure we've all had an experience of a job where, as you were kind of describing earlier, where you're just sort of thrown this vague task and you're not really given any sense of like what, what success looks like or what the performance expectations are. There's no real goal. It's just go and write a document. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. What kind of document? What, what about? How long? When by? Yes. Who for? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I'll just go and write a novel then. Yeah, cool. <laughs> That'd be fun. <laughs> it's, you know, mm-hmm. I'm making it absurd to make a point. but <laughs> Yes, no, totally. Successful CEOs, what are some of the key habits that you see the most successful ones that are incorporating into their weekly routine? Mm, Yes. Okay. So a few things. One is something I like to call a CEO power hour, which is really a CEO date with yourself. So if we think about, you know, big businesses, we've got a CEO, we've got board of directors, several VPs reporting on different areas of the business, right? This is what's happening in sales, this is what's happening in marketing, etc. In a smaller business, we may not have all those VPs. And so us as business leader still need to have our pulse on what's happening in the business. And so this hour is really that time. It's a weekly time set in your calendar, non-negotiable. So unless there's some life tragedy that happens, you're at this meeting with yourself. And what you're doing is really reviewing and reflecting. So you're reviewing where am I in terms of my revenue, in terms of other metrics that I'm following? What's most important for me this week? What are my priorities to reach my goals, right? So we've taken those big 12-month goals, broken them down into 90 and then into monthly goals. So what do I need to do this week to help me get closer to my goal? Bite-sized pieces that we can actually manage. and then. That needs to be time and space on my calendar. If it's not on my calendar, it's probably not going to happen. And so really setting our week up for success to say, what are my top three priorities? When have I allowed the space to get it done? And so having that hour date with yourself really makes a world of difference and really sets your mindset up for that leadership and that you know, CEO mindset that you need to have going into your week. Are there going to be fires? Probably, right? Is there going to be some day to day that you're being pulled in? Probably. But at least you're starting your week, you know, with the right intention and and setting yourself up for success. So that's one piece. The second piece is your calendar. And what I like to call your scheduling ninja, and you can have this ninja working for you or against you. Hopefully you want it working for you. Um, But no, in all seriousness, really looking at your calendar and setting up what a model week would be for you as business leader, right? So blocking off times for things that are important for you, both in your life, but in in your business. 
um, so that we don't just, you know, turn on our laptops and be reactive to what's coming in our inbox, what's coming in our Slack, what's beeping on our um, phones, so that we actually have time to focus on those things that we need to do. So if, you know, marketing is part of your your role still and you have to make content to, to put out there, set up that, that block of time so that you have time in your week to do that. You know, on Tuesday mornings, that's when I, you know, create my new content. On Thursday afternoons, that's when I have my client calls or whatever that looks like for you, but setting up those hours and then sharing that with your team so that your team know this is how David operates. Oh, David normally longs in at you know, 7 p.m. on Thursday because the rest of his family is out and he likes to do things at that time, right? Um, but just being open and honest, yes. No chance. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and so just being open and honest with your team so they're aware these are the times when I can expect to find my leader and, you know, to be able to communicate with them. And these are the off times when if I send a message, that's fine. They'll get it when they, you know, when they, they return. But just having that open open there. And then if you have someone on your team who is responsible for booking things in your calendar, they now have some guidelines, right? They know where certain things can fit. Give them some guidelines and how many meetings in a row can you handle before you need a break? right? Uh, Because we can all get zoomed out. So knowing, you know, where our capacity is and building that into our our calendar really makes a difference. And that proactiveness is, is so, so important. And then the third piece of that is really just what I like to call a CEO score. So it's really looking at of all the things that happen in my business, I can put them into two buckets, maintenance and growth. So maintenance tasks, things that need to get done, but question, do they need to get done by you as business leader? So admin, customer service, setting up, you know, landing pages, changing something in your process, invoicing, um, you know, all those types of things. Yes, they need to happen, but do they all need to happen by you? Maybe you only need to have your finger in a little piece of that process. The other bucket is growth level tasks. And this is where you as CEO need to be spending most of your time. So networking, partnerships, new masterminds where you're presenting in front of other audiences, maybe, uh, you know, learning that you're doing to your audience, creating new content, new courses, whatever it is, new products in your business. But there's certain things within your business that you have to do, right? I mean, this podcast is a good example. I reached out to David to be a guest on his podcast. There was some automations that happened to get me booked in his calendar. We didn't have to go back and forth. Oh, Tuesday at two, does that work for you? No, that happened behind the scenes, right? But actually being here and doing the podcast and doing the research on who I am and what questions we're going to ask, that's David's role. But he doesn't have to do every piece of getting this podcast out into the world, right? So figuring out what pieces do I need to touch as business leader and what pieces can I delegate either to a real human or to a machine in automation um, to, you know, relieve some of the the day-to-day that I have to do so I can focus on those growth level tasks. And where the CEO score comes in is that we actually measure how much time you're spending in the week on those growth level tasks. And the bottom line is the more revenue you want to make, the more time you as leader need to be spending in those CEO tasks. It makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, And I hate to burst the bubble, but yeah, I am a business of one. So I do all of it myself. Yes. (laughs) Okay. the automation. But yeah, I I get the point you're making though. And I'm sure the majority of podcasters aren't like me and doing it all on their own. No, but even automation yeah. counts, right? That's yeah, still true. a way of delegating. It's just we're delegating to, you know, software instead of a human. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, and big shout out to Tidy Cow as well. They're not yeah. a sponsor, I just think it's a great tool. Awesome. Okay, so let's let's get more into the leadership side of it. I know we've kind of been talking about it anyway, but yeah, from your own career so far, what do you think is the biggest leadership lesson that you've learned? Mm, good question. Yes. I think I would have to say being willing to see my mistakes, owning up to them, 
and then being willing to adjust and change. Right? Knowing that I am not perfect by any means. And when I see that opportunity, when someone presents something to me, to try and look at it objectively and then grow from that really makes a difference. And when we do that, I like to, to journal. So I like to document some of those things. And when you look back a year ago, you can easily see what has changed a year later, right? So yes, it's slow progression, but it's, uh, it's nice to see that, that growth. Yeah. I think, you know, self awareness is one of the most important skills, I think, for leadership. And it, and it is a skill because it does take practice. Very few people can just automatically do it. Mm. And I think it's almost counter to, to like the human condition, isn't it? To sort of take that long, hard look at yourself sometimes. Yes. Um, but it's, it's so important. And, and the lessons you can learn from doing it as well are so useful. And, you know, if, if you want to get really into it, you can ask other people what they think of you and your leaders. Mm-hmm. So I think, yeah, that's, that's pretty scary stuff for most <laughs> leaders, actually. But you yes. have to have real trust in the relationship, I think, before you ask that question. Definitely. <laughs> True. Yeah. Um, which in itself is a sign of whether your leadership's any good or not. Because mm. for the, the new leader, the first time manager, person who's never really been exposed to leadership before, what would be your best piece of advice for getting the best out of that role? Mm-hmm. Yes, I would say definitely trust, having open and honest conversations, and frequently. So when you first step into that role, it may feel like you're over communicating with your, you know, the direct reports that you have. But I think it's better to start there then you can always adjust and, you know, communicate less frequently than the other way around. So having that open space, communicating frequently, giving feedback frequently, rather than leaving it, you know, six months, 12 months, and then we have a big performance review or we have this formal um, discussion, you know, bring, bring it up on your weekly meetings when you're meeting with those team members, right? Shout out to somebody who's done a great job on something, you know, and if something needs correcting, take the time to to do it, you know, in ways that we talked about. But I think communication is such a big, big part. I agree. Yeah, definitely. I, I'm a big fan of the praise in public and I don't say reprimand, but that's not a very nice word, but yeah. do that bit in private. Whatever mm-hmm. you want to call it. Yeah. Yes. Um, and again, you know, so many people get that the wrong way around. Yes. Just, oh, don't embarrass people in front of everyone and then don't hide away the fact that you're happy with something either. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm absolutely telling you too much about leaders I've worked for. Um, <laughs> okay. Difficult question now. We've only okay. got difficult ones left, I'm afraid. Sorry. I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> if, if you could go back in time to the start of your career, Mm-hmm. What advice would you give your younger self? Mm, yes. So I think definitely for me, letting go and thinking outside of the box. Because I'm very analytical and very methodical and things got to be done a certain way, but they don't. Right? And so letting myself let go a little bit of that and being able to think what's a different way we could do this how could we do this better what's a different way of looking at this has really helped and not something i did very well at the beginning Um, definitely at the beginning i would get frustrated that things weren't happening you know just the way i thought they should and very narrow in, in my thinking and so being able to really step back, almost have a bird's eye view on what's happening. Getting outside of it and looking in makes a big difference. So I think that would be my my uh, my suggestion there is, yeah, being willing to sort of open up and, and how things could be different and better. Yeah, me too. I like that one. I think, you know, I was the same. And I think it particularly as early in your career, I think that's partly because – you lack experience mm. and that can be damaging to the confidence 
And so to try and gain control over those problems, you try to kind of systemize things and make everything, everything in its place, everything in its order. Yes. Um, and it probably speaks to the project manager at heart as well. Uh, yes. <laughs> for both of us. <laughs> and I think, yeah, you know, it's, it's completely understandable, but it's also like really difficult to break out of mm -hmm. at that stage of your, your journey. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Good advice though, definitely. I think what helped me really to break out of it was actually working with visionary leaders mm. because they thought so different from me, right? They were innovative. They quickly had different ideas and let's get this going tomorrow, right? Whereas I'm like, oh no, this needs to be researched to every detail. Are we sure this is right? And, you know, they were just so free almost compared to the way I <laughs> wanted to do things. So I think actually learning from them helped me let go a little bit of that. Yeah, I, I think I know what you mean. I, I mean, I definitely wasn't fortunate enough to work for a, a visionary leader, at least I wouldn't call them that. Okay. Um, but I did spend a lot of time almost exclusively for my whole career, actually, in small businesses. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of the same thing because what you're doing, what you're working on, what your job is even, almost changes every week because right. the business is so small that everyone yeah. ends up picking up something of everything. Yeah. And so that, again, it, I hated it for a long time, but it forces you out of that box. Mm -hmm. You have to become more flexible because if you don't, stuff doesn't get done and you probably yes. lose your job. So <laughs> Right, right, yes. Um, yeah, it's interesting though, the different experiences. Mm -hmm. Leadership Heroes. Very often, this is my favorite question, and it's the one that everyone seems, not everyone actually, some people get really easy answers to this, but a lot of people struggle with it. Mm -hmm. It's called Leadership Heroes. And my question to you is, if you had to pick one person, they could be anyone you like, they could be alive, dead, past, present, real, fictitious, if you're feeling a bit mad. Okay. Um, who, in your opinion, would perfectly embody leadership? Who would that person be and why? Mm, good one. Yes. So I think, well, they have a lot that come to mind, but I think I would have to say Nelson Mandela um, for his revolutionary, you know, anti apartheid um, movement in South Africa because he really demonstrated a lot of qualities that I believe good leaders and successful leaders have. I mean, courage, resilience, I'm mean, what, 27 years in prison and still stuck to his vision because he could see it so clearly. Purpose, inclusiveness, and forgiveness. I don't know if I would have been in the same boat after 27 years in prison. So definitely, I think that there's so many qualities that he had and brought to the whole movement that I think um, he would be one that stands out for me for sure. It's a good choice. We've had him before, I'm afraid, so you don't get your bonus points. Oh, is that choice. right? Yeah. Hey. Um, <laughs> it's not a competition. I'm just kidding. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think he's one of those leaders and he's come up before and the conversation I I've had always about him is I would have loved to be able to have a conversation with him actually and interview him and ask him the question at what point in your life do you think you became a leader because mm. I, I think I mean, he was quite self-deprecating as well so I do wonder like did he ever see himself as a leader at all or was it only once he was elected that he saw himself that way or did he think from right from the beginning he was leading by example he was the leader of a cause yeah, I'd, I'd yeah. love to have known his answer to that, and it's sad that we never will. Maybe, yeah. maybe he has answered it, and I've just not read enough about him. But maybe, um, <laughs> yeah, that's so true, right? At, at what point do you think you were a leader? Yes, mm. yeah, yeah. I think that would be quite insightful into his character. The answer to that question as well. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, and I, I, the other reason I really like him as a choice is one of my favourite leadership quotes came from him, and I, I'll horribly paraphrase it because I can't remember it word for word. Okay. But the essence of it was about the role of a leader and how people want you to be there as a leader to stand between them and harm, whatever it might be. 
But then when things are good, they want you to be their advocate, standing behind them, digging them up, shouting at them, you know, shouting their praises from the hills. Yes. And I think that was just so spot on about that responsibility of the leader, but also the privilege of the leader mm-hmm. and, and those two sides of when things are going wrong, you've yeah. got to be the on the spot and you've got to take that on the chin. Yeah. And when it's going well, you you need to fade into the background a little bit and let your people take the credit for that. Yes, yes. And not, not always easy to do, oh, right? God, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's incredibly difficult. You've, you've really got to be able to set your ego aside, I think, to do that mm. well. Mm-hmm. Um, and you've also got to be open to taking that risk of, in certain situations, losing your job because yeah. you're stepping in and taking the blame and protecting people. Yes, yes, or, for or sure. Or worse, in his case, of course. Yes, <laughs> but that is it, isn't it? I mean, if you think about business, you got to be willing to take risks, right? Whether it's financial risk, whether it's, you know, marketing, whatever that risk is, hiring this team member, you know, having a brand new ideas is going to take off. But mm. that, yeah, risk is, is definitely a piece of it. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things. Another unpleasant thing that you have to become comfortable with, isn't it, if you want to be any good as a leader? <laughs> yes, yes, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that was a good pick. Thank you for sharing. Um, And we're almost out of time. So the last thing I'll ask you is if any of the listeners want to learn more about you, um, perhaps listen to your podcast or get in touch, perhaps even work with you, uh, would you like to point them towards website or similar? Yeah, thank you. So my website is ceoamplify.ca and the podcast is the same name, CEO Amplify. Um, So you're welcome to check that out. I do have some free resources there, one being a CEO Power Hour playbook. So if that sort of discussion we had about the Power Hour kind of resonated with you, then you're welcome to go and download that PDF. It really just walks you through, okay, here's my Power Hour, now what do I do? Um, And so you can get into the habit of of building that into your routine. Oh, that sounds awesome. Yeah, excellent. Well, Donna, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure meeting you. I've really enjoyed this conversation and uh, yeah, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, David. You too. Listener, thank you for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and gained something useful from it. Leading in the business world can be tough, especially when you're just starting out. So don't go it alone. Join our online community for new managers. It's free for 60 days and your engagement and honest feedback are all I ask in return. Explore more at www.leadernotaboss.com. Donna, thank you again so much for your time and contributions today. I really enjoyed speaking with you. Listener, if you'd like to learn more about Donna and what she does, then you'll find that link again in the episode notes. And as always, I really do encourage you to click on that, learn more, read more, find out all about Donna. And that's all there is for today. I hope you'll be back with us again next week when I will be interviewing executive coach Dave Bates about his work, his journey from organizational communications degree to corporate career, C-suite roles, and then to solopreneur and coach. He's got some really great perspectives to share on leadership and the world of work. So don't miss out. Make sure you're with us next week. Same time next Wednesday. And until then... Be a leader, not a boss.